everyone. It's Justine Browning here at the Ziegfeld Theater in New York City for the premiere of the second half of season one of Outlander. There are so many layers of emotions going on and playing out. The scenes between Claire and Jamie, oh my goodness. How yeah, the honeymoon <laughs> is definitely over. The honeymoon we is over. However, I think it's interesting that they f fell in love after they were married. You know, the showrunner has said that before. But how does does that play out over the course of, of the second half of this season? The fact that they are now in love and yet they have to face a lot of difficulties. Well, I think what we really see is, you know, a couple trying to stay together. I mean, you know, they got married under duress, but they, you know, there was obviously a moment where they fell in love very deeply but now there's all of these external forces coming into play that threaten this relationship plus the friction that comes from being two people from completely different times really comes into play as well so I think they both have to come to terms with that they might not always be able to accept each other's actions but if they can come to some sort of an understanding of why that happens then you know that that's a good basis to to build a good foundation on so yeah I think it's I think it's amazing and I think it's been really interesting to play as an actress how two people really you know weave their way through the nuances of what what keeps two people together in a relationship and what's so fascinating is that you know 1740 Scotland obviously a very difficult time for women and at first Claire is just like I need to get out of here but gradually there are parts of that world that she begins to like I was wondering if you could speak to that yeah, I honestly think that the immediacy of life that exists in the 1740s, I think Claire really thrives in that time. I think it really speaks to the type of, um, yeah, the, I don't know, the, the, the energy that she has. She, she just thrives in that time. I think that she is so instinctual and she would never have been a happy wife sitting in Oxford playing second fiddle to her professor husband. I don't think that would have worked very well for her come through a war so yeah, yeah exactly. she's yeah. used to she's used to kind of living on life's edge and I think that that's that's somewhere that she feels very comfortable living the first episode back is the reckoning where we actually get to see Jamie's perspective yes. and I think it's an important episode that we see through your perspective would you agree absolutely yeah I think it's it, it sort of marks the beginning of, of a sort of slight shift in in focus and we see a lot more of Jamie's background, a lot more of Jamie's past, um, and and what he sort of goes through to be in the situation. I think before this part of this, you know, the first half of the season, Jamie might come across, you know, is is kind of a he can't do any wrong, you know. But I think we definitely delve deeper into his background, his past, and you know, he's a young man that has to make a lot of decisions, and uh, it's really tested throughout the season. I think what we're reminded of is that he is a product of the 1740s. You know. Absolutely, and therefore there are, you know, a lot of challenges that they face each other, and um, ultimately, you know, that's the clash that, that she's a modern woman and he's a man of his time. Um, he's very forward-thinking, but ultimately, yeah, he, he has to learn lessons, and as as does she, you know. What you think she's kind of brought to his life? How has she sort of changed his views? Absolutely, he, um, as I said, you know, he's a man of the time. He's he has to grow up very quickly. He before he meets Claire has very little responsibility he's kind of run away from his past uh, he's gone to, to, to Spain to fight um, in the French army you know with his French sort of um, army and he's uh, come back to Scotland and, and, and really has to address all the old sort of past experiences and past issues that he's had which includes his family his, the death of his father his sister um, and also Blackjack Randall. Uh, I'm Team Frank. I just want to put that out, okay, there. Right out there. He's a nice guy. You can just sit by the fire with, read yeah, history yeah. books, yeah. have a read. spot of tea. Do you like history? You're a, you're a history reader? Of, of course. Okay. That's, that's why I love Outlander. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Jamie, that's a dangerous pursuit. <laughs> Claire's always finding herself imprisoned, kidnapped, being So you're not, you don't like hurt. the bad boy. You like the, the, the stay-at-home uh, history reader. Well, you know, he, they've just come through World War II, Frank and, and Claire. So I think they kind of need a little bit of downtime, downtime. When, when season one starts off. Yeah, listen, I'm with you. I, I, do, I agree. I agree. What I love is that, and this is not really necessarily in the books, uh, Frank's given a really interesting kind of backstory. We get to know a lot about his relationship with Claire, so much so that it's a lot harder to accept uh, the fact that she's in another time period and that you know Frank is out looking for her. Yeah, I mean, that's something that uh, Ron and I 
both felt strongly that we needed to make a, a Frank as a fully formed and as uh, as, a, as a sort of as real a marriage as we could make it, so that um, you know when she makes the decision not to return, that that has real impact in the story. Yeah. So. Um, Kind of given a glimpse towards the the end of the first half of the season, what he's been going through. He's been searching for her. He's yeah. been in agony, and you know, I'm just wondering for you, did you have to fill in sort of all of those months for Frank that have been going on that we as the audience don't see? Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, I think the writing does a, a lot for us, but yeah, I kind of filled in what he might have been going through and what's been going on, and the, the police investigation and the sort of gradual sort of loss of faith in the sort of powers that be and I guess him coming to terms with the reality that his wife is not coming back. Yeah. And of course this half uh, of season one is so gruesome, it's so dark. How did you prepare to tackle this material? Um, I mean the truth is playing this dark material uh, is actually very enjoyable. There's a real relish about it. It's, you know, it's um, great fun to play those dark, uh, nasty, isn't that why we see, why we watch stories? To sort of have that vicarious thrill. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a great baddie and I, I, I really enjoy playing it. I have to get a shot of the kilt, please. Oh. <laughs> this is the first time I've seen a kilt on a red carpet before. Is that right? Yes. yes. Congratulations. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, it's it's. Uh, I always like wearing it. So uh, yeah. Well, I think what's interesting is that both Dougal and Colm, they are you know men in 1740s Scotland, and because of that, there is an inherent sense of brotherhood. You know, they're bonded together. And I was wondering how you think that both hinders them, but also benefits them. Good question. Well, it benefits them in the first instance because I cannot do it on my own because of my. Sure the physical condition, but it hinders, it hinders us, it hinders me as the leader of the clan because he is subscribing to uh, a cause which I, think, cause which I think will threaten our very existence. So there is a really serious, and this is historically true, I mean Diana Gabaldon has based this on historical fact and um, you know there was clan against clan and family and against brother family, against brother. brother against brother. <laughs> yes, indeed. And that's reflected in our relationship. I don't agree with the road that Dougal has taken. It has very serious implications. I'm already stepping out of line harbouring. Colin is stepping out of line harbouring Jamie. But And this is an added trouble, you know. So, yeah, there are pros and cons. He brings in the rent. I do. But he undermines our very existence. And I fight your wars existence. for you. Yeah, yeah. My, all that minor stuff. Yeah. 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 So what we've seen is that Claire coming into the picture, a woman who's very defiant and yes. speaks up for herself, oh my goodness. Yes. Uh, she's really, I think, definitely changed the dynamic of the group. But oh, well, it's groundbreaking stuff, I think. It really is, you know, a 21st century woman being placed in that context in the way that Diana did with the books and, and, and with the show. It's, uh, it's absolutely fantastic, great role model. Um, and the kind of woman that Dougal finds very attractive. He likes strong women. He likes Gaelis. Uh, we, we never meet Maura, his wife, but I imagine she's quite a tough cookie too. Uh, but yeah, he likes strong women and uh, she's a fantastic proto-feminist really. Yeah, yeah she's, I think Colm, she poses a potential threat. She's an unknown quantity, but at the same time, incredibly enigmatic. And the very fact that she has a different makeup, different conditioning, different outlook, it's, uh, yeah, Colin picks up on this. It's intriguing, but it's also very dangerous. I just wanted to know how Gilles's relationship with Claire changes through the second half of season one. So Gilles has become Claire's best friend pretty much, right? And so, you know, obviously that friendship from the start has been a bit weird as well because Gilles keeps kind of asking a lot of questions about Claire's secrets. Um, and obviously Claire has a secret in the world she's now part of. We all know that secret where Gilles kind of also turns out to have some secrets. So we get to see more of that in this half of the first season. I think what we also get to see a lot of is how misunderstood she is. You know, a lot of women are misunderstood during, yes. you know, late 1700s yes. Scotland. Yes. But specifically, she's described as an evil sorceress at one point. So I wonder if you, wondering if you could speak to that as well. 
Yeah, obviously, Gayla is a scene in a certain way because, you know, she's a bit different, she's a bit exotic, she seems to kind of play around with, you know, herbal, herbal um, herbs and uh, concoctions. And um, But then we get to understand why, and you actually kind of get to, hopefully, get to feel for, for the character. And, you know, she, you get to see a softer side of her as well.